in about two thirds of the world, Christians of one stripe or another face some sort of harassment. It can result in imprisonment, torture, and even martyrdom for the cause of Jesus Christ. The level of brutality is almost unbelievable. Christians in innumerable countries are under huge amounts of pressure, either from the government or from the societies in which they find themselves. They number some 2.2 billion people, and harassment can range from loss of life to loss of livelihood. Christians have become an endangered species in some countries of the world. Well, I appreciate having your company today for the persecuted church. And I'm delighted that joining me in the studio to co-present with me is Andrew Boyd from Release International. Good to have you, Andrew. Good to be here, Gordon. Thank you. Andrew, today we're going to be talking primarily about Iran. But yesterday you, you sent out a press release about a country called Burkina Faso. I have to confess, it's not a country I know much about. Well, I think a lot of us would struggle to find it on the map. But it's part of the Sahel, and the Sahel is that region in the north of Africa which covers the Sahara down to the point where, where Africa turns green. And sadly, what's happening there is that that is becoming the epicenter now for jihadists at work. So we've seen all of that in the Middle East. We've seen that in Iran. We've seen that in, sorry, Iraq. We've seen that in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But now we're beginning to see that actually in this area. In Burkina, Burkina Faso, was uh, struck by a jihadist group last weekend. And what happened there was that 160 people were killed and that followed another attack on another village which killed 14. And these groups are affiliated to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. And Release International partners say they are targeting Christians, obviously not only Christians, but just as we've seen in Nigeria, pretty much the same kind of feel as we see there with the work of Boko Haram, for example, these militants are taking out schools, they're destroying schools regarding Western education like Boko Haram as being sinful. So that's what's happening over there. That's interesting. I was going to say, last month we looked at, at Nigeria, and one of the things we said about Nigeria was more Christians were killed in Nigeria in 2020 than any other country in the world. So what you're saying is it's beginning to spread out in that part of Africa. Yes, it's the same kind of thinking. It would be a mistake for us to think it's one particular group that's doing this, but it is a movement and the ideology is exactly the same. It's a, a determination to Islamize Africa and it's happening in the Sahel and it's happening in Burkina Faso. Well, we're not going to talk about Burkina Faso today. That's just by way of introducing and something of the work that Andrew gets involved with, particularly with Release International. But today, we want to come to the country of Iran. If you watch the news, you will see it almost constantly every few days for something going on about Iran in our news. But today, we particularly want to look at it from a, a, a historical point of view and from a Christian point of view. A Andrew, the amazing thing is when we look in our Bibles, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, then we discover that Iran is talked about. They don't actually say Iran, do they? But they're talking about the country of Iran. Yes, that's right. So we're talking about Medes and Persians and Parthians who were there, who had gathered from that area of the world to go up to Jerusalem for Pentecost to find that they'd got far more than they bargained for. The Holy Spirit is poured out on them and they go back to their countries along with everybody else, spreading the gospel and establishing the church. So here's the thing, when we think of Iran, we think of it as an Islamic country. There were Christians there first, mm -hmm. and what's happened in that country over the years is that there have been waves of persecution. Interestingly enough, not so much to start with at the hands of Islam, but before then, so there was persecution there in the third century and in the fifth century, and later in the 14th century, by a Muslim warlord called Tamerlane. 
And then, when it came to the First World War, so bringing us a little bit more up to date, we found that Ottoman forces in the First World War, particularly towards the end of that, uh, carried out terrible massacres of the population. So, Christians in particular, so in some pockets of Iran, Christians would have made up something like 50% of the population in pockets. In those areas now, it's down to 1% to 2%. That kind of exodus has been going on. So modern-day Iran, today it's about 90% Shia Muslim. And as we know it, the, the Muslim world is broadly divided between Sunni majority and a Shia minority, represented typically by Iran. The two are often at loggerheads with one another. They're fighting a proxy war in Yemen right now over, over the differences. And there's a huge debate about the number of Christians there. So recently there was a secular survey carried out by a Dutch organization which estimated that 1.5% of Iranians were Christians. Now that doesn't mm. sound much, but it's way more than the official figures. Officially the government says it's about just over half a million. 1.3% puts it at well over a million. And some Christian ministers estimate a million to 1.3 million Christians, many of them secret believers in Iran. The church is growing rapidly there. Amen. Well, we want to talk about the church in Iran. And uh, we want to start by showing you a piece that uh, George Thomas, who's one of the uh, correspondence with CBN has produced. Uh, he went to, to join a group of new Iranian converts who were being baptized. And they decided for safety's sake that they couldn't be baptized in Iran, they would have to fly to another country. And we haven't got time to see all of his report, but this is part way through his report where he's talking about what it is to be a Christian in Iran today. Sabi says Christianity is growing fastest in his native land than in any other country of the world. More women are coming to Christ than men. As a result, women are now in key leadership positions within Iran's underground church movement. 40-year-old Azar is one of them. She used to follow the laws and tenets of Islam to a T. I was a very strong Muslim, a very devout follower from a young age. I prayed every day to Muhammad. I wore the full hijab. I didn't want any man to ever see my face. I never wanted to cause a man to sin by looking at my body. Still, Azar says 30 years of devotion to Islam left her restless. Like many women in Iranian society, she felt less valuable and on the edge of despair. I always questioned why Muhammad gave us a religion to follow that didn't allow us to be free and happy as women. There were so many restrictions on what we can and cannot do. 11 years ago, she watched a movie on the life of Christ, and she was changed. I realized that I was following a lie, that Islam was a lie. And at times, I felt those 30 years I spent being Muslim were wasted. But Jesus said he would restore those lost years. Azar now runs a network of secret underground home fellowships. Because we don't have a church to gather in, we have to keep our groups small. Not more than five or six people. We constantly change days, times, and locations to avoid getting caught. Azar watches Sasan regularly on Mohaba TV. When he's not busy baptizing fellow countrymen, Sasan is co-hosting a popular show on the channel showing Iranian Christians how to operate house churches and spread the gospel inside the Islamic country. It's one of the greatest resources we can offer the church inside Iran, a church that doesn't have any access to any educational institutions, any theological schools, any church buildings, established Christian institutions. Through these programs, we are mobilizing and resourcing the house church movement in Iran. Mohabbat also has a virtual church platform, giving undercover Christians the opportunity to connect with others scattered around the country in a safe and secure environment. We're realizing that a lot of isolated believers in Iran, they do not have any chance to have fellowship with anybody else. So we're using the virtual church as a bridge. Shema is a Mohaba TV phone counselor. She says many recent callers to the channel expressed anger with Iran's government leaders. People blame the regime for all their problems because they know the country is wealthy. We have oil and other riches, but the government doesn't care about people's suffering, and they are fed up. 
The Iranians shared with me just how devastating the sanctions have been for their lives. More than a year after the Trump administration levied crippling sanctions on the Islamic Republic, today the nation is in deep recession, there's high inflation, and the country has lost most of its value in its currency. After a few days of Bible training, worship, and prayer, the 20 Christians headed back home to Iran, carrying with them Bibles, Christian literature, and hundreds of micro SD cards containing evangelistic material used to share hope and the love of Jesus Christ during these uncertain times. They knew it was a risky mission, but worth it. Hopefully when you see these images of people getting baptized and hear their testimonies, you are drawn to pray for Iran and the whole Islamic world because they are lost and need Jesus. George Thomas, CBN News, somewhere in the Middle East. George Thomas there reporting from the Middle East. And, and I suppose you can't look at something like that, Andrew, without being excited about what God is doing. And, and it's a strange dichotomy about Iran. You have a growing church, you have a persecuted church. You have a persecuted church, you have a, a growing church. That's well, been, that's, been the same ever since the Book of Acts, hasn't it, Gordon? That when the church is persecuted, it grows. It's one of those odd dynamics to do with the Kingdom of Heaven that I suppose what it does, it concentrates the mind. And if you look back at the history of Iran, the revolution began to gather momentum in 77. 78, the, re the revolution broke out. By 79, the Ayatollahs had come to power. Millions of Iranians were out on the streets cheering in the Ayatollahs. And then the persecution of Christians really began in a big way. So in all of these things, we know that, that, that God is God and God is in charge and God does good things through them. But if we look at the nature of the persecution that's happening there, you find that because it, it, Iran became a theocracy, it became heaven on earth as far as the Ayatollahs are concerned. It's an Islamic Republic and Islam is not just a religion, it's a system of politics. So it affects your entire life. If we want to understand the mentality, we have to look at the Pharisees that Jesus dealt with, who said there are rules for absolutely everything, that a good Jew should only do this. So a good Muslim should only do those things. And that means that because Iran is a theocracy, an Islamic state, therefore evangelizing Muslims is forbidden. No Muslim is allowed to convert or change their religion. That's absolutely forbidden. You can't preach in the local language, which is Farsi, or distribute any Christian literature in the local language, which is Farsi. And there's an identification there that if you do these things, you are an enemy of the state. In other words, you're kind of one rung above being a spy. You're a Zionist, or you must be working for the CIA. Now that means that the underground church, people who can't meet uh, in churches publicly, typically the Protestant church, who speak in Farsi, because that's the language they use, who share literature in Farsi, all become enemies of the state, and these are the people who are persecuted. And that, that's the interesting thing, because when you look at the church in Iran, then it, it does go back to, to the time of Pentecost and uh, the Book of Acts, but it grew into very much an Armenian church and, and, and uh, a Syrian church, was and it? Catholic, yeah. And, and they very much were in the local dialect of the people. Whereas what's been happening since the Shah went and uh, Islam came to the fore was the church is growing in the common language of the people, in other words, in Farsi. And it seems to be that which has brought about the explosion of the church. Yes, that's right. So in terms of the way that impacts Christians there, if you were a Muslim who had come to Christ, that your conversion would not be recognized. You would just be a Muslim. So let's say you want to take communion. That means as a Muslim, because you're not a Christian, that's not allowed. You are drinking wine, that's breaking the law. So Christians from a Muslim background who take communion can face 80 lashes for that. And there's one who's gone through that twice now. So it's extraordinarily difficult to be a Christian there. But for the pastors, particularly Pentecostal and Assemblies of God pastors who've been running underground churches, some have been executed by the state, some have been assassinated by the state. Some names are familiar, Mehdi Dibaj, Bishop Haik, Hofsepian Mayer, Hossein Sudman, for example. 
and they're often accused of undermining national security. Very difficult situation for them, even though God is working amazingly. He is. Well, I had the opportunity of talking with uh, Mansour, who's uh, CEO of an organization called Article 18. He'll explain what that means and who he is. So have a listen to this. So I'm pleased to welcome here in the studio with me, Mansour Borji, who is from Article 18. Lovely to have you. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you very much, Gordon. Tell us where your home, I know your home is the UK, but where was home originally? I was born in Iran, actually, in um, an area of Iran called Kurdistan, but uh, raised uh, in uh, capital Tehran before um, leaving Iran to come to the UK to study theology. Okay, and when you, when you were growing up in Iran, uh, in terms of faith, did you have faith? I grew up actually in a very um, uh, diverse family uh, background. So we had people with, with beliefs in, uh, in God, um, but also those who didn't. So um, my family background are Muslim, so we have Shia and uh, Sunni Muslim in our family, but I ended up uh, searching for the truth and uh, became a Christian when I was a teenager. All right. And you work now for an organization called Article 18. What does Article 18 do? Or, or why, why do you call it Article 18? Exactly. For that very question we call it, uh, it, it always uh, intrigues people to find out what is it. And it gives us an opportunity to emphasize this uh, covenants, uh, international covenants that Iran is a part of, uh, which in uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, also International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, both of those covenants in Article 18, it emphasizes individuals' right to religious freedom. So everyone has to have the freedom to choose a religion of their own and be able to exercise it freely without fear of cohesion, uh, um, uh, being forced to convert um, and uh, Iran, although it's a signatory to that, um, those two covenants, but it doesn't uh, abide by it, and therefore we want to keep Iran accountable to this and make, and make sure that people are not persecuted simply because of exercising their faith peacefully. The, the news that we're hearing coming out of Iran is that in the Shah's day, it was a tiny Christian church that existed in Iran, and, and that there's been a kind of explosion of uh, people coming to faith in, in Christ in Iran over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Is that correct? Well, that's a very popular belief, and um, uh, for years this has been uh, spoken about in Christian circles, obviously because of uh, the information that comes from the church inside the country. Uh, but re very recently, in 2020, a secular um, organization conducted a survey uh, finding out about uh, Iranians' uh, religiosity to see how people actually perceive their uh, uh, faith in God and so on. So it was very interesting. In, uh, in a large pool of uh, data they gathered, they realized um, about 1.5% um, of those respondents identified themselves as Christians. So if you extrapolate that, mm -hmm. it's a significant, it's nearly one million of the population. Um, so that puts it more in perspective. Uh, we have people who put the numbers from 250,000 all the way to three million, which is right. very significant. Your particular work is to seek to help those who are being persecuted because of their faith in Iran. If I said to you, give us an example of, of somebody that you're involved with, maybe you want to change the names and whatever, but give me an example. Well, let's say uh, we have people who have been arrested in a house church. Now, the question is, what is this house church? Is it a kind of uh, strange phenomenon? The reason is that most of the churches that offer uh, their services in Farsi, a language that everyone, despite their uh, different uh, ethnic or uh, uh, language group they belong to, could go and understand because it's a language is spoken by everyone in Iran, it's a national language. So those churches were under a lot of pressure to cease their services because the Iranian government was very concerned about the growth of the uh, Christianity in the country. So they were shut down and people like myself who spoke different languages than Assyrian and Armenians, those are the two ethnic groups that traditionally have been Christian inside the country, 
uh, found no other way but to meet in uh, small groups in churches to worship and do the Bible study and everything else that we do normally in, in our churches in the West. So those people are arrested constantly. Every year we have reports of many of them arrested. So they report to us and we'll have to f find out uh, every detail about this and be their voice basically to advocate for them, to offer any help they would need to uh, recover. All right, so if folks want to find out more about Article 18, they go to your website, which is very simple, isn't it? You tell us what it is. Article18.com, all letters. Uh, all right, easy. so if you want more information about the work that Mansour is doing and to find out more about Iran, there's lots of different videos on there because I've looked at the site. I'd encourage you to go there. Mansour, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. There's so much happening in the church in Iran that we'd love to show you with. So, a Andrew, there's your camera. Why don't you just talk for a minute or two about the church in Iran today? I, I, it's so exciting what is going on, actually. I want to give you a couple of quotes from a part, two partners of Release International, which works with the persecuted church. They're called 222 Ministers. I'm not going to give you their names, but listen to these quotes. In the last 40 years, amid severe persecution of the church, only matched in ferocity by the Emperor Nero, more Muslims in Iran have come to love and surrender to Christ than the combined number in the last 14 centuries. In the last 40 years, more Muslims have come to Christ than in all of the years right back to the coming of Islam before then. Something remarkable is happening, and God is at work in extraordinary ways. One more quote. I've seen incredible miracles and healings. People crippled for 10 years getting out of their wheelchairs, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, all amidst incredible joy. The number of stories I've heard about people having dreams and visions about Jesus is incredible, and many have had physical encounters with Christ. It's extraordinary what is going on there, and not just Iran, but where Iranians are leaving the country, being driven out, they're taking some elements of this Christian revival with them. Watch this space. Amazing, isn't it? Well done, thank you. Well, we want to show with you, as we come towards the latter part of our program, the story of one young lady. We talked a little earlier on about maybe a million, more than a million Christians. Every one of them has got a story. But this is a story of one lady, Sagar. And it talks about her faith, talks about her persecution, and it talks about the miraculous. Have a listen. In this moment, I want to share one of my bitter memories with you. They break in with a crowbar. There were 22 of us having our gathering in my small flat. First of all, they separated the women and men, and the women were told to put on the Islamic hijab. Each year in Iran, secret house churches are raided and dozens of Christians end up in prison. But a few months before the raid, Sagar had attended a meeting of Iranian believers to learn how to manage such a situation. I remember I was shivering with fear, but I started to remember everything I learned in case of persecution. In that moment, I tried hard to manage my emotions rather than let myself be too afraid of them. I asked to go to my room first, then the bathroom, because I had a memory card there from a theology college that had teaching materials on it. I took that with me to the bathroom, broke it and flushed it down the toilet. In the bathroom, I took my phone out of my pocket and took a photo of myself. I sent it to my pastor outside Iran, who I'd been video calling just before the agents raided the house. I gave them the news that we were facing arrest and asked them to pray for us. Then I quickly deleted most of the Christian apps. Sagar was interrogated by the intelligence agents, but she was able to avoid immediate arrest. She managed to flee the country just minutes before the warrant came through for her detention. When I was at the airport, an officer was there to try and stop me from leaving. It seemed almost impossible to get on the aeroplane. 
The only thing that really helped were Bible verses that I could remember because I didn't have my Bible, they had taken it from me. And I was remembering the story of Daniel constantly about how God saved him from the lion's den and the verse which says, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. When I got on the aeroplane, it took off with 15 minutes delay. Later on, my sister told me that after I boarded the plane, they called out my name more than 30 times when my warrant came through. When I reached a new country, I remember for a while I was afraid of anyone in a police or security officer's uniform. Every morning I felt disoriented and expected secret agents to raid my house at any time. In the street I felt like they were following me and I just kept looking behind me. And for nearly one year, any time I would go to sleep, I would have this nightmare that I was back in Iran and was going to be arrested again. Today, Sagar lives safely outside of Iran. But Christians inside Iran continue to face raids by the secret police. God is at work in Iran and he's at work in the most amazing way. From a human point of view, Andrew, I suppose I feel slightly disappointed because Sego had to leave the country. She wasn't able to stay in Iran and continue her witness and, and the work that she does. There. And that, that seems to be happening, doesn't it? But increasingly, Iranians are having to flee because of their faith in Christ. Yes, that's right. And there are other cases as well. Some people find themselves about to be sentenced. One pastor, Victor Bet Tamraz, 66 years old, was told he was going to be given 10 years in jail for telling Muslims about Jesus. He'd been to jail before. He said, if I go back, I will die there. So he had to leave the country. But we have to remember in all of this, God is at work and God is in control. So there is a move of the Holy Spirit among Iranians in Iran, and those who are leaving are taking it with them. Let's go back to where we started, the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Those who are in old fashioned Iran turn up in Jerusalem, get filled with the Spirit, go back and take God with them. The same thing is happening now with the Iranians who are leaving their country and taking the Lord with them wherever they go. Well, we pray that the day will come when they, having received here in the West some, some wonderful teaching and growth as, as Christians, will go back into their own country and seek to evangelize even more. It'll be a good day. Amen. So every time that you see uh, Iran coming up on the news or whatever it is, you're reading the newspaper, we want you to remember to pray for the Christians in the land. Pray that uh, they, they will grow in their faith, grow, pray that they'll be strong in the face of persecution. Pray that the Lord will have his hand upon that church there. Andrew, I want to say thank you so much for being with me today. Such a pleasure, Gordon. Thank you. And thank you too for being with us. And uh, keep praying for those of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Until the next time, God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>